Hello everybody, my name is Ross Mould, I'm AJ Bell's Investment Director and welcome to this webinar on how to read company accounts with a particular focus on checking whether a dividend is safe or perhaps not. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we start, if I may. Here's a disclaimer, uh, the key points of which are we don't offer financial advice, so if it is important that you understand the risks involved and if you're unsure about anything, please do contact a suitably qualified financial advisor. He, will, he or she will take into account all sorts of issues, such as tax, as well as your specific personal financial circumstances and particular financial needs. And past performance is not a guide to future performance under any circumstances. Also, I should stress that we will be looking to, uh, we will be recording this. So you will be able to listen to this at your leisure because we will cover a lot of ground may not be able to get through everything today in as much detail as you would like. So we welcome any feedback, any further questions, and you will also get a copy of the slides. And again, you can see those at your leisure. And if you find this useful, we will perhaps look to follow up with similar events in the future, either looking at new areas, related areas, or indeed going back on some of these topics today in much closer detail. So to get on with it, we're first of all going to go to go through the basics of the three parts of a company's set of report and accounts. We'll then do a bit of a scratch and sniff test just to help you do some quick filters when you're looking at a set of companies' report and accounts, which will perhaps set you onto certain themes when you do deeper research. A look at why cash flow is king, particularly in the context of dividends, and then come to some conclusions. So, the basics. Accounts come in three parts and they're all interlinked, so they should not be looked at in isolation. They should be looked at together. And they, they are the profit and loss account, known as the P and L, the cash flow statement, and the balance sheet. Most investors look at the P and L first because that's where the headline earnings per share and profit figures are. And that's what tends to capture the most media attention and the most immediate attention from companies. But actually, really, you need to look at the balance sheet first because that gives you downside protection. The cash flow second because it's cash flow that pays the bills and funds the dividends. And it's the profit and loss account third. So actually, most people look at them the wrong way around. Listed UK firms have to publish interim results, first half results as they're also known, and full year figures. In America uh, and any company with a US listing, they have to actually publish quarterly numbers. And also, companies may provide trading statements in between their scheduled figures, especially if there's an event. And generally, an event, if a company has given any profit targets or guidance for the year, if it thinks it's going to exceed or miss those by a quite a big percentage, probably 10 to 15% or more, then they will put out a trading statement to, ex to update their shareholders as quickly and as efficiently as they possibly can. Now, the accounts are a key starting point for analysis, but I must stress, they are not the be all and end all. They're a snapshot. The profit and loss account and cash flow figures you will see will cover a six or 12 month period in the case of interim or full year results, or a three month period in the case of quarterly results. The balance sheet will refer to just one specific day, the end of the quarter, the end of the half, or the end of the full year. So companies will naturally look to put as positive a gloss on those as they possibly can not just to reassure shareholders, but to perhaps please a bank or appease a bank who will have lent them money, will be carefully checking the profit and cash flow numbers to make sure that it's gonna get its money back and that no covenants are breached. If you think about house builders, for example, look at when the company's financial year ends tend to be, April, May, June, July. Why is that? Well, because if you think about it, they generally build the houses autumn, winter, and they sell them in the spring. People go out and look to buy new houses in the spring. When the weather's better, they can get out and about and they're looking to plan ahead a little bit more. So the house builders will not want to publish their accounts at a time of maximum cash out. Houses being built, fewer houses sold in the winter. They'll want to publish their balance sheet when they've got the maximum amount of cash receipts in from customers as new house owners turn up. And that's why their year ends at April, June or July, for example. And there's nothing illegal about that. There's nothing in any way underhand about it. They would argue it's just them trying to give you a better feel for what the company actually, how it's ebbs and flows and the seasonality of its business. But they will pick a seasonal time of year that makes things look best. And so one of the things that you always need to do with a company that says it has a net cash balance sheet 
is look in the profit and loss account and see whether under financial income there's a net interest charge or not. Because there have been lots of companies in the past that claim they've had a net cash balance sheet, but have paid interest over the year because they actually have debt. But then lots and lots of money comes in at the year end and they can actually therefore pretty far the balance sheet a little bit. The other little slice of hand that you need to be aware of, and I think in my nearly 30 years of looking at company accounts, this has become a, a major issue, is companies reporting adjusted or normalized numbers and talking about those first and emphasizing those and triggering management bonuses and option programs off those, not the stated or statutory accounts. The stated and statutory numbers are always audited. I know some people might not think the auditors have done a brilliant job recently in the case of some companies, but that they are there to police adjusted, normalized numbers and not audited. It's a little bit like asking a chef to taste his or her own cooking and give it a Michelin rating or not. So I'm not saying that what companies are doing is necessarily wrong, but it gives them maximum scope for triggering management options and payments, potentially at shareholders' expense, although your interests are in theory aligned. And it also gives companies maximum scope for prettifying the numbers and making things look better than perhaps they might be in the real world. And we'll come back to this adjusted and normalized versus statutory theme on a regular basis. And just this is the man. I know that Mr. Buffett is getting a little bit of criticism because his performance hasn't been as good as recent year in recent years. But what he has to say on key topics such as accounting have stood the test of time because he has. So just two little quotes here for you. Earnings could be as pliable as putty when a charlatan heads the company reporting them. Eventually truth will surface, but in the meantime, a lot of money can change hands. And also perhaps with more, more importantly, with my point about how accounts only cover a finite period of time and the balance sheet only covers one particular day, Managers and owners, that means you, dear listeners, need to remember that accounting is but an aid to thinking, never a substitute for it. So yes, we need to dig into the numbers very closely, but then like a good detective, we need to lose a little bit of our imagination to look behind the facts so we can piece everything together. Now, three parts then, profit and loss, cash flow, balance sheet. This is a FTSE 100 company. They've actually got numbers coming up very, very soon in the next week or so. Halmer PLC. Now, I think these are a relatively straightforward set of accounts. The adjustments column in the middle, there's, no, there's not a huge amount of drama there, although there are still some. But here's a very simple P&L. Revenues at the top, that's sales of products and services. Operating costs. Then you have the cost of goods sold, you have research and development, sales, general and administrative costs, and that leads to operating profit. Revenue minus operating costs, operating profit. And that is the pumping, beating heart of the company. That is the ultimate measure of how good a company is at what it actually does, the operating margin. Operating profit divided by operated by revenue is the operating margin. The higher, the better, and the higher the margin will reflect competitive dominance, strong brands, uh, strong service revenue, the type of business it is. Uh, for example, steel is generally a low, is either a very high or very or negative margin business because it's boom or bust. Software generally very high margin because there are low uh, fixed costs and, the, and it's very scalable to sell. Once you've made, developed the software, it's a, a matter of selling it to customers, you deliver what used to be, I guess, a, a, a DVD or a compact disc. Now you deliver it seamlessly through the internet and the cloud. So the actual cost of selling more of the, pa of the package is very, very limited. You then have things like uh, financial income, interest income or capital gains on disposal of equities or other financial assets. Financial expense, that's the interest expense I told you about earlier. It could also include uh, payment for leases, contributions to the pension fund. So it's this figure here, financial expense netted against financial income. If that's negative and the company is showing you a net cash balance sheet at the end of every period, you need to have a good think about why that would be. The, the answer is actually it runs a net debt balance sheet throughout the year, then gobbles, then brings in a huge amount of cash at the, through, through seasonality or through very careful cash collection. Then you hit pre-tax profit. That's normally the sort of headline figure that companies will talk about. Knock off the tax. Then you get to net profit and that you divide by the number of shares in issue to get the earnings per share figure. And then the loose calculation for dividend per share 
you know, then you can work out the payout ratio. So you divide the dividend per share by the earnings per share. In this case, it's you know, broadly 30 odd percent, and that will get you the, that will get you the payout ratio. Um, ideally, a payout ratio rule of thumb no higher than 50 percent. We'll come back to that later for, for dividend cover of two. Flipping the calculation the other way around, you divide earnings per share by dividend per share. That gives dividend cover two times gives you a buffer in case anything goes wrong in the future. You can make examples for business with particularly stable or predictable demand, potentially utilities, for example. You would have argued in the old days cigarette stocks, though how predictable tobacco is now is a little bit more open to question given regulatory and health pushback. And drinks companies, beverages, alcoholic or otherwise, generally relatively stable businesses can run with a higher payout ratio because they've got a better idea of what their revenues are going to be every year. Industries which are just sick, normally cyclical let alone given the current circumstances of COVID-19 and, and the lockdowns, businesses where demand will swing around a lot according to the economy, steel, autos, anything consumer related, airlines. Again, the, in some cases it may not be for wiser than to pay dividends at all, but if they do, you certainly want to see a very high level of cover here because profits can be sky high in the one day and then the next day can be you know, low or even indeed in loss. So that's a very, very basic P&L. Revenue minus operating costs equals operating profit. That really measures how good a company is. You then get adjustments for how it funds itself. Does it have a net cash balance sheet or not? Knock off the finance expenses or income. That takes you to pre-tax profit. Take off the tax, that's net profit. Then earnings per share and then dividend per share. And the adjustments here at Halm are relatively small. We can see here the asterisk at the bottom includes amortization, acquisition items, restructuring costs, profit or loss and disposals, pension benefits and associated taxes. So there are potentially some movable beasts in there. The good thing is here, the adjustment is relatively small. In a perfect world, you don't see any adjustments at all. And in fact, some of those things you may ask yourself, well, do they appear every year? And even in the Halmer's case, the answer is pretty much yes. So then you ask yourself, well, if they're happening every year, are they exceptional? And if they're not exceptional, should they be adjusted for at all? And you could argue with some justification, the answer to that is no. That's then a judgment call for you, how comfortable you feel with regular exceptionals and how big they are. One sign that Marks and Spencers was in trouble was that every year the exceptionals got bigger. So the stated profit got smaller and smaller, even if the underlying profit didn't go, the adjusted profit didn't go down anywhere near as fast, though it was still under pressure. Now you will have noticed here, I've got operating profit, pre-tax profit, net profit so i've got different types of profit so when we talk about profit we need to be careful here and these are just some other key terms so you'll hear me talk about revenues there you'll also hear people talk about sales or turnover gross profit that's another type of profit that's minus cost of goods which is the actual physical cost of producing or providing a product or service but not excluding operating expenses they're separate and that's not for example selling general admin depreciation or even research and development Operating profit we've talked about, that's also called trading profit or operating income or EBIT, earnings before interest in tax or PBIT, profit before interest in tax. That measures the value added of the company's core business and for me is a key test. You then have profit before tax known as PBT or income before tax and net profit, also called profit after tax, net income, attributable profit. And if that wasn't enough, companies then chuck their own one in quite often, EBITDA, operating profit plus depreciation and amortization. Depreciation and amortization are accounting constructs. They don't exist in the real world, but they're there to try and account for the fact that assets get old and eventually need to be replaced. Uh, and indeed, trademarks wither away or goodwill associated with an acquisition. If the acquisition goes wrong, they've overpaid for it, then they need to write down the intangible balance, the assets on the balance sheet. Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's uh, sidekick, says that whenever he words, hears the word EBITDA, he thinks of, and I won't use the full word, BS profits. So that's up to you to decide whether you agree with him or not. But the number of companies that use EBITDA is large, and it's because they're actually stripping out chunks of cost that are just natural for their business to absorb. So they're trying to put a bit of a positive gloss on things, whether you like it or not. And I would generally treat it with a degree, not complete skepticism, but with a degree thereof. So several different flavors of profit. You need to know which one you want to look at, which is most relevant for the business. But ultimately, for me, operating profit is king, even if net profit and earnings per share are the things that tend to perhaps grab the headlines. Now, 
Why is it important to focus on different types of profit? Well, this depends on where you are in the pecking order. And I will tell you now, dear shareholders, you look at the chart on the right, the table on the right hand side, you can see where you come. Bottom. And that's why we have something called the equity risk premium, because as a shareholder, you are taking the biggest amount of risks. It's also why when things go well, you can get the biggest set of rewards because the share price goes up and you can get dividends. If you're a lender to the company, you get your money back and you get your interest coupons, but the value of the loan doesn't rise. And if heaven forbid something goes wrong, when well, you start to lose money on the loan as well. So what you need to look at here is where you are in the pecking order and shareholders, again, your bottom. So if anything goes wrong and a company goes bust, the chances are by the time all these other lot have been paid off with a liquidator sat right at the top for their services. And don't forget the, the, the new COVID loan schemes, the government's even talking about putting itself pretty much at the top, if not even above the liquidator. Then you've got the liquidator, you've got the first debenture, which is the senior bondholders, then preferential creditors like staff who need their wages paying. Then you get a junior bondholder, unsecured creditors like the tax man, unsecured loans like junk debt, mezzanine debt, or pick toggle, which is payment in kind. If the company hasn't got any cash, they'll pay you in kind. Preference shoulders, and then again, the ordinary shoulders. That's why you hear when a company goes bust, Oh, the bondholders got so many pence in the pound because once all the assets have been sold off and the bills paid, that's their share of what's left. By the time it gets to you, shareholders, there's very rarely anything left. So bondholders have first claim via interest payments. You get what's left after the profit has had interest payments and tax taken off it. And the net profit then helps fund your dividends. So this is very important. If we go back to the previous slide, Bondholders are interested in everything up to pre-tax profit, which is why I put that line there. Shareholders, you're getting what comes below that line, pre-tax profit down, even if a lot of the case, what you're measuring will be driven by operating profit, because that again tells you how good a job the company is at actually doing what it does day to day. Cash flow also has three parts. Cash from operations, which we partly discussed through operating profit. Cash from investing which is, as it sounds, capital investment and putting money back into the business to strengthen it, reinforce it. And cash from financing. Has it raised or paid back debt? Has it paid dividends? Has it raised cash from shelters through a rights issue or replacing, for example? Those three features then give you the net change in cash. You add that to last year's cash pile, maybe possibly adjust for the little things like foreign exchange. And then you see how much physical cash is actually on the balance sheet at the end of the year. And let me tell you now, companies very rarely go bust because they have no cash at all. They go bust just because they haven't got enough. And the chances of Halma going bust, as we shall see here, are virtually negligible. If Halma gets into financial difficulty, then we are indeed all in deep trouble. So three parts of the cash flow, net cash from operations, net cash used in investing, net cash from financing. This is operations. And as you can see, this is why operating profit is so important, because it's right at the top of the cash generation list here. You then add back depreciation and amortization because they are non-cash items. So you mustn't be completely cynical about this. You can't, you know, the, the company doesn't suddenly uh, take a big loss on an asset. It, it's simply a paper construct. So it's a non-cash item, so that's added back, but you have to factor in the fact that it's gonna, it's gonna wear out over a fixed period of time. Halma then makes pension contributions. It may make a profit or loss in disposals. And then the other big swing factor is one as net working capital. Inventories finished physical stock and goods sat in a warehouse or being shipped to a customer. Receivables, money that customers have not yet paid for services or products delivered or rendered. Trade payables, well, that's a, you know, a good thing for a company because it means you owe somebody money and you haven't paid them yet. So what companies will try and do is collect their receivables as quickly as they can and run their payables for as long as they can, because that means cash in on the receivables and you're keeping cash on the payables. Some companies can be very networking capital intensive. You know, if you're delivering a ship, for example, and some won't be capital intensive at all, networking capital intensive at all, like software potentially. Although with a software as a service model, when you're billing revenues in say 12 chunks every year, you will see some receivables because the money will only be booked as those chunks are completed. And then, Another key payment, which people often forget about, the tax man cometh, and that is a cash payment. So those key features there will shape net cash from operations, operating profit, DNA, and working capital, the big ones, 
with then tax knocked off. Then we move on to the second section, which is net cash used in investing. Capital investment's always the big one here. Investing in your business, in your assets, in your brands, in your products, your services, to strengthen your competitive position, keep competitors at bay, provide things that customers want to buy, ideally at the price at which you wish to sell to them. That is deepening your competitive position and it's vital. You may also see acquisitions here. You may see disposals here as well. They may be regular or not. And then from financing, dividends paid, obviously a subject very close to many of your hearts. Purchase of own shares, that's share buybacks. It doesn't always have to be a buyback. It could be to say put into the pension scheme. It could be to cover options dilution. Interest paid, new bank borrowings is debt up. Repayment of bank borrowings, debt down. Now in Halmer's case here, you've got all of those numbers adding together, look, and basically it's completely funded itself. It's paid back debt. It's funded its operations. It's made the investments it's needed. It's even made the acquisitions. And the net cash figure has gone up over the year, which generally speaking, I would view as a good sign of a healthy company with good margins. So, and this goes back to why is cash flow important? It is used to invest in the business to maintain and to grow it. They pay the interest bills, pay the tax bills, pay dividends to you, the shows. In other words, to survive and then hopefully thrive. Because if they can't afford to pay their interest and they can't afford to pay their tax, that's when you're in trouble. That's when the administrator or the receiver or heaven forbid, ultimately the liquidator get involved. And as a shareholder, then you're at the bottom of that pile of nine and you're going to get nothing. So that's why cash flow matters. Profit is a matter of opinion. Cash is a matter of fact. All right, I know that NMC Health this year has done a pretty good job of fudging its balance sheet. And Patisserie Valerie did a pretty decent job of confusing the auditors as well by inflating its operating margins. So if you're determined enough, it can be done, but it's an awful lot harder to fiddle cash than it is to fiddle profit. And I'm not talking about fiddling in a nasty way necessarily, but when you recognize your revenues is a clear one, is, is a simple example of how you can inflate revenues and inflate profits temporarily but not get the cash. Well, let's just give me an, let's give you an extreme example. Let's just say I am selling you a lift, an elevator, and I sell you four elevators for your lovely new skyscraper, all carefully socially distanced and all very well planned to facilitate people going back to work in the future. And in that lift contract, there is also 10 years worth of service revenues. Now, I'm the CFO. My stock options don't trigger if unless I hurt a certain profit hurdle. No, look, what I can do is not only can I do and decide to book the revenues on the four elevators safely delivered and installed, which for which I have been paid. But if I was particularly cynical and you can't really do this now, but it used to happen, you would then book all 10 years service revenues up front as well, with which there would, of course, be no costs because you haven't sent the man or the woman with the hammer and the spanners and the bag and the oil can to go and do the servicing. So that would make your revenues look good. It would make your profits look even better because there's no costs associated with a big chunk of those revenues. But it wouldn't help your cash flow because there would be a big jump in trade receivables because you haven't been paid for 10 years worth of service revenues that you've already booked through the profit and loss account. So that's why you need to look at profit and loss account and cash flow in, as interlinked and not separate items so these are the sort of clues that you need to start looking for i'm not saying a big jump receivables is always a bad sign but it's definitely worth asking yourself why another key one that computer makers always used to get involved with was known as channel stuffing oh dear we're not going to make our quarterly revenue or profit targets so what do we do we offer a boatload of incentives to all of the pc sellers and vendors and quote stuff the channel so as soon as that computer leaves our factory and goes onto the shelf in the shop We'll book that as a sale. Great. Shows up in revenues, bloats your profit. Doesn't show up in cash because the shop hasn't sold the computers and so they can't pay you. So your trade receivables go up again. Inventory build is another one. High fixed cost businesses. The more that you shove through the same factory, the lower the cost per unit. And again, that helps sort of ameliorate your cost base. So, you know, I when I was an investment banker, I remember there was a, a a colleague came back from a brick company where there were literally bricks piling up in the car parks. So we couldn't get his car into there to actually go and see the chief executive, but the company was reporting booming volumes and booming profits 
The fact is it just wasn't selling the bricks. So the inventory was going through the roof. So again, revenues look good, cash flow didn't. And again, Mr. Cuban, he's a millionaire, a billionaire. He owns the Dallas Mavericks, so he should know what he's talking about. Not a fan of companies that don't pay dividends, but again, that's a matter of personal choice and also your long-term personal investment strategy. You may be much more focused on capital gains, but if income's your thing, companies that don't generate much cash are gonna find it jolly hard to pay dividends to you on a sustainable basis. The third part of the chain, now I admit I've committed the cardinal sin of looking these in reverse in the order that we should do, but I've done it because everybody tends to look at it this way, is the balance sheet. It also has got three main parts. Assets, short and long-term. Liabilities, short and long-term and shelters funds also known as an assets or equity and to answer one of the questions I've already received on my little ticky here on the right hand side the difference between short and long term liabilities and assets generally one year or less is a short term asset or liability one year or more is generally a long term asset or liability so if the assets going to you know be worthless within a year or say it's a shareholding or cash it'll be say seen as 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 a short term asset even though they won't necessarily be worthless I hasten to add a liability that needs to be paid with back within a year, like say a trade payable or a short-term debt, that's a short-term liability. A long-term liability could be you know, a 10-year loan, whereas a long-term asset could be a ship, a steel plant, a production line, things that are gonna have a long life, but one year or less, one year or more, generally speaking. And you will see here to answer another question, the balance sheet always balances, always balances. The profit and loss account and the cash flow feed into the balance sheet. And for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. It's basically double entry bookkeeping as advised by the Renaissance Italians. And we'll look at this in greater detail. You can see here, look, assets equals liabilities. Simples. And indeed, assets minus current liabilities, and non-current liabilities equals shareholders funds or net assets. Because in the end, shareholders funds or net assets, let's just say something goes wrong. Worst case, the company goes bust. The net assets of the company are what's left when all the assets have been sold and all the liabilities have been paid off. And that's what's left to divide up between all of those credit, that long list of nine creditors of whom you are bottom. So in Halmer's case, it'll be 981 million pounds. Now that's probably a bit dramatic. The, the, the book value of the carrying value of the assets could be conservative. But that's why certain investors used to swear by investing in things by book value, because if they were paying less than shareholders funds and assets for a firm, they felt they were getting a bit of a bargain because if everything went wrong, they could buy the whole company, break it up, liquidate it and make a profit. Perfect downside protection. It's harder and harder to do that now because more and more companies are intangible. They don't have big plants, big factories, big ships. They have software engineers, programmers, servers at best. So you can't liquidate the, the programmers because they'll just decide to leave your firm and go and work for somebody else's. So those calculations don't work for certain types of companies. They work for good old fashioned metal bashers and manufacturers, don't work for new economy companies, internet companies and so on, so e-retailers. E so you've got to be a little bit careful there. But the balance sheet will always balance and I'll explain why in a second. Looking at this, this is a full balance sheet with the key headlines in, 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 in bold italics. And if I was to say to you, for example, just just to say a company um, raises money from its shareholders, equity would go up on the right hand side, cash would go up on the left hand side by the same amount, it balances. If a company builds a new factory, cash will go down, but on the top half of the balance sheet, PP&E, productive plant and asset and equipment will go up by the same amount, it will still balance. If you decide to stuff your channel as a computer maker, your trade receivables will go up, but your cash will go down by the same amount, your balance sheet will still balance. Equal and opposite reactions all the time. So this always balances. So you can see what the key parts are there of non-current assets, basically plant production and equipment. Goodwill is when you've um, paid for a company, you bought a company, paid more than book value. So you've paid for something that doesn't exist, so to keep the accountants happy, there has to be something there to balance for that, and that is called goodwill. Other intangibles are things like brands, brand names, for example. Then you've got working capital there, inventories and trade receivables, and you've got cash. Uh, then on the current liabilities, you've got short-term borrowings. You may have some tax payments coming up. You've got your trade payables, money that you owe your suppliers that have to be paid within a year. 
In retail, it's probably 60 to 90 days, for example. And then long-term liabilities, you've got borrowings, you've got your pension deficit, if there is one, retirement benefit obligations, and again, possibly some tax, and then you've got your shareholders' funds. But these will always balance off. There's always an equal and opposite reaction. Now, this is answer to another question I got, actually just this, um, a couple of days ago, um, was on uh, how do you measure the strength of balance sheet? Well, there are lots of ways of doing it. This is the headline one, net debt and net debt to equity. So net debt is very simply cash adjusted for short-term debt and long-term debt. Now, confusingly, a net cash balance sheet is shown as a minus number in brackets. And then a net debt balance sheet is shown as a positive number because most companies have actually got net debt. And also, when you're actually looking at the total value of a company, you look at something called the enterprise value, where we add net debt or subtract net cash from the market cap. Because that is the price, if you were a corporate raider, you're looking to take over the whole company, that's the price you would pay. You'd pay the market cap, you then adjust for the cash you're inheriting and adjust for the debt that you're inheriting. And actually, that is how any investor should address any company, whether you own one share or 100% of the shares, because you're an owner and you'd better think like one. Because again, as the old Buffett quote goes, if you don't own one share for a week, then, then why on earth would you bother owning it at any stage at all? So cash adjust for debt. So Halma here has a £182 million of net debt broadly. It's got equity or shelters funds of 981 million. Its gearing ratio, therefore, is just 18.5%. 181.7 divided by 981.4, that is a low ratio. Depending on the type of business, you can withstand much higher than that. Utilities probably go up to two, 300% because they pretty much know they're going to sell water and electricity all year round and get paid. Might be a bit different at the moment, but generally speaking, that stands the test of time. So that is a key test. But you then need to keep tie these into other things. The pension deficit, it's a liability. If you were to be a corporate raider, you would have to fund the pension deficit. You've got to put that in. Leases, these used to be off balance sheet and used to be a minefield for investors. They're now on balance sheet. You don't have to go to page 400 of the account to find them. Leases, that's what did for Debenhams. It didn't have much debt, but it had four and a half billion pounds of leases on its balance sheet. And the landlords wanted those leases paid every single year. So when Debenhams profits went through the floor, it couldn't fund the leases. That's why the shares went to zero. And contingent payments, they can be in a worst case lawsuits. Uh, they can also be in a best case, um, a trigger payment on an acquisition. If a certain profit threshold is met, then they have to hand over more money. So that's probably the best type of contingent payments. But you better know what they are as well. Because again, you're technically on the hook for them as, as, a, as a shareholder or an owner. But so once you've got your basic gearing calculation, you can adjust for those three points as well. And then you need to tie them into the cash flow on the P&L. So look at interest cover in the P&L, operating profit plus interest income. Divide the sum of that by interest expense. Ideally, it's over two times. Gives you a buffet of comfort. Same for cash flow cover. You would make several, you would then take operating profit, add on depreciation, amortization, take off working capital, take off capital investment potentially. So again, so you know exactly how much cash you've got to fund those all important payments. Check for pension payments and deficits, look for payments for leases. All of these things are cash out before the cash can come to you as a shareholder for dividend, capital investment, pensions, deficits, leases, contingent liabilities, all cash being taken away from you to feed other mouths. You want, you're going to be getting what's left. So I hope that helps. And there's a lot of detail there, so I'm sure we may have to do another one of these. But here are some quick health checks for you, just to do a bit of a scratch and sniff test when you start to look at these companies in more depth. Good signs, strong cash flow, exceptionals are truly that, exceptional. Companies aren't reliant on acquisitions. The best acquirers are those, I would dare say, like Halmer, though that's not a recommendation that supplement existing momentum in the business with acquisitions. They don't try and cremate, create momentum with acquisitions, like perhaps a restaurant group did with Wagamama, with at the moment fairly deleterious consequences. The, the company's not reliant on associates or joint ventures, businesses that they don't wholly own. Vodafone on the face of it was hugely cash generative, but most of the cash was locked in the Verizon wireless US business, which it didn't fully own, so it couldn't get the money out. It eventually sold the business to release the capital. You want to see growth coming from price, not really, and volumes, not just cost cutting. You can't cut costs forever. There'll always be some kamikaze merchant coming in cheaper than you, 
and eventually you start cutting bone and muscle and not just costs. You don't want to see companies fiddling about with their working capital because it means they've probably been cute with their revenue recognition. Companies that talk to me about growth make me feel poorly. Growth of what? Fred Goodwin grew the Royal Bank of Scotland. Didn't work very well, did it? So again, focusing on growth for the sake of it is a no. Focusing on cash flow, very important. Management incentives are long-term, not short-term triggers. And again, you want to see interest cover exceeding two. You want to see dividend cover exceeding two, just in case there's an unexpected dip in the economy and an unexpected dip in profits coming around the corner. It gives you a bit of security. Smelly things, things that stand out, make you feel poorly and could potentially get you in trouble. Companies that call their numbers broadly in line, well, then they're not in line, are they? Think about it. So just be careful how those numbers are presented. Second half weighted forecast, non to get companies in trouble. That means they've got the prema out and they're hoping for something to come and bail them out if the first half has been a bit weak. Normally comes and bites them on the bottom, Imperial Brands being a most recent example. Frequent acquisitions can be a bad sign, particularly if they're designed to be, if they're big. And if they're transformational, then be very careful because that normally is management speak for. We really, really wanted it. We really, really had to have it and we've overpaid for it. Very sorry. Weak cash conversion is not normally a good sign. It may mean there could be accounting jiggery pokery going on or that the, peanut, the, the operating margin is as strong as you like think. Regular exceptional items mean, again, that management are marking their own homework. Unusually low tax charges. Well, there's nothing wrong. You know, some people may think that, yes, come, the, the tax man has his or her legal take. But if companies can legally minimize their tax charge, then all well and good to the benefit of the shelter. But the tax man can catch up with you. So don't rely on it. Unintelligible footnotes, InterServe was the master of that. If companies don't want you to understand the accounts, there's a reason for it. And if you don't understand anything, you don't invest in it. There are nearly 2,000 co-opted companies in the UK. If you don't understand or don't like the accounts, you have the option of not having to play. Regular restatement of the accounts is not a good sign. It means they don't want you to understand something. Or if the company has given you a key performance indicator in the past, a KPI, and says it isn't one now, it probably means they've missed the key performance indicator. Management aren't going to get paid unless they can think of a new key performance indicator, which means you're potentially being diddled. Off balance sheet liabilities, there's fewer of them now because leases are on balance sheet, but do watch for lawsuits and contingent liabilities. And again, you want targets, management targets to be testing to align their interests with yours. Always check what triggers management pay because incentives drive behavior. And so, you know, if companies are triggered to have an earnings per share trigger, you can easily manipulate for a while, at least your revenue recognition, possibly even your tax charge. And as I proved to your balance sheet to trigger the earnings per share number, you can cut investment. Dead easy way of, you know, tr 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 you know in marketing, dead easy way of triggering short term profits, but to the detriment of your long term earnings power, if you're not investing in your brand, your sales force and your people. And then in the end, management are cashing out short term you're potentially getting stiffed long term. So you've always got to look at what's triggering management targets. Why is cash flow king? This is just a practical example. This is a FTSE 100 company. It used to refer a lot to adjusted EBITDA, two crimes at once and a normalized cash flow, a third accounting no-no. And it also had a lot of debt and a big pension liability for good measure. And we can see here this pecking order issue again, operating profit, creeping down showing competitive pressures add back depreciation and amortization very capital intensive business look lots of assets getting old networking capital not bad capex huge and going up so it's fighting on several fronts that gives you operating free cash flow and then you get these key cash requirements that come before you and your precious dividend tax interest on the debt fill up that big pension deficit ladies and gentlemen and then lease payments as they came on balance sheet. What's the result? Look at your free cash flow and how it compared to your dividend. It was two times cover five years ago, but after that, no, one and a bit times, less than one, no cash flow at all in 2019, barely one times in 2020. So again, very, very limited cash flow cover, certainly no scope for anything going wrong, no scope for capital expenditure going up to fight on front on all fronts. Result this year, the dividend was cut. The, the company, BT, just goes to show it wasn't that hard to predict. All you had to do was look in the accounts. Gavin Patterson was, for, was targeting 10% dividend growth a year. He got fired when that didn't happen. 
Philip Jansen, the new boss, came in, said he would defend it. A year later, he cut it to nothing. One of the reasons being capital investment on all fronts, because he's fighting in broadband, he's fighting in content, he's fighting in wireless, he's fighting in telecoms. He's got the regulator on one side, fleet of foot customers on the other, loads of competitors on the other. So again, accounts on their own don't tell the story. You then got to put it in the context of what does the company do? What's it up against? Is it the regulator? Is it customers? Is it competitors? How can it cope with them and how can it spend to deal with those challenges? And BT's ability to spend was crimped by interest, pension contributions to a lesser degree leases, and the dividend was therefore an easy sacrifice to make in the end. It was all in the accounts. You might not have got it looking at the P&L, but you'd have got it looking at the P&L in conjunction with the cash flow and the balance sheet, because the balance sheet drives the, the interest payments. It drives the pension contribution. It drives the lease payments. The cash flow gives you the working capital and the capital investment calculation, and you get the operating profit from the p There's only one, two items in there from the P&L, really. So again, dividend checks, you want to see earnings cover exceeding 2.0, that's earnings per share divided by dividend per share. You want to see free cash flow cover exceeding 2.0, and there's your definition. Plus check interest cover, and again, check the balance sheet, net debt to equity, not forgetting leases, pensions, and contingent liabilities. So this beastly issue of normalized this and adjusted that, here's our man, Mr. Buffett. Bad terminology is the enemy of good thinking. When companies or investment professionals use terms such as EBITDA or pro forma, they want you to unthinkingly accept concepts that are dangerously flawed. In golf, my score is frequently below par on a pro forma basis. I have firm plans to restructure my putting stroke and therefore only count the swings I take before reaching the green. So, in conclusion, in the short run, the stock market is a voting machine and in the long run, it's a weighing machine. That's Ben Graham, who was Mr. Buffett's mentor. What did he mean by that? Markets will latch on to revenue growth, subscriber growth, even profit growth in the short term, if there is any, voting. In the long run, cash is king. That will dictate the value of a company. It will drive your dividends. And in the end, the company is only worth, in the very long run, the cash that it can generate. And it's going to have a finite lifespan on balance. Only 25, 26 of the FTSE 100 from 1984 when it first started are still in the index. Company lifespans are relatively short. They only generate so much cash before they're superseded or regulated away or customers get sick of them and go and find somebody else. It's a very special company that can withstand all of those challenges for long and they'll only generate so much cash and that's the value that you're going to get out of the business. Votes therefore drive the short-term share, share price in terms of people looking at profits or subscriber growth, what have you. But it's cash and fundamentals that drive long-term value. And to look at fundamentals, again, it's not just looking at the accounts, it's competitive position. It's management acumen and strat its strategy, and then it's financials, balance sheet, then cash flow, and finally PL. So that gives you a true three dimensional view of a stock. Now, we haven't got a lot of time left for this, but I have received quite a few questions. We've, I've tried to deal with quite a few actually as we have gone through um, this. Um, we've had a question on long leases, which hopefully I've dealt with and why they're so important. Uh, what happens if shareholders are the subject of fraud? Well, as I've explained, you can try and sue, I suppose, get a shareholder action group together, but there's going to be nothing left, unfortunately. So there's going to be nothing left to sue for, I'm afraid. I think it's going to be very hard to pursue anybody, which is a terrible shame. Hopefully, I've described the difference between current and long-term assets here, uh, which is a question I've, I've got. Um, why don't balance sheets balance? As I've explained, they always balance. Uh, and I've explained how and why they equal and opposite action and equal and opposite reaction. I'm trying the American strategy for investing and I'm having difficulty identifying five areas. Sales growth rate, earnings per share growth rate, equity growth rate, operating capital. Well, the growth rate is just this year divided by last year as a X minus one expresses a percentage. So you can do that for yourself, but I wouldn't do it over just one year. I'd do it on a compound basis over five or 10 years or look at it over a cycle because then you won't be just looking at when things are going well. You can find out what happens when things go badly and how much downside protection that you've got. So return on invested capital is very important, yes. And that is net operating profit after tax divided by the sum of short-term debt plus long-term debt plus shareholders funds. That's the actual capital invested in the business and used to fund it. 
the higher, the better return in invested capital. And in the end, if return in invested capital exceeds the weight adjusted cost of capital or ROIC exceeds WAC to get all jargony on you, the company's creating shareholder value in a mathematical and genuine sense. That I think is probably for another presentation. But return in invested capital, net operating profit minus tax divided by short term debt plus long term debt plus shareholders funds and then growth rate figures you work out for yourself just in a little Excel spreadsheet uh, using the percentage function and um, you can then take them back as far as you want but I would look to compound them over time not just look at one individual year or two individual years um, you don't trust yourself to read them do I consider adequate to rely on the summaries analysis in such a stock of Peter and Shepard they're extremely good they save you a lot of digging around of accounts um, but they are you know not like but in the end as I've just said you can't rely on the accounts entirely they're not a correct answer machine you need to look at them interpret them how they've been presented uh, look at look do the scratch and sniff tests look at what the time of year that they're struck uh, and then tie them into management strategy management acumen the competitive position of the business so yes accounts are our first port of call absolutely and services like Stockopedia and SharePad will save you a lot of time because they'll pull a lot of numbers out for you, but they won't go through some of the footnotes you need to check. They won't go through strategy and things like that. So you still need to do some detective work, I'm afraid to say, useful as they are. Um, if you're buying a small listed or unlisted company, how do you determine its price? That's a valuation uh, issue. And I will come back to that, I suspect, having just asked that, been asked that question. Um, in a future webinar if there is sufficient interest. Um, P ratio, that's a valuation issue again, but we talked about earnings per share, so let's let's do that very quickly. The PE ratio is the price earnings ratio, the share price divided by earnings per share. It, you can do it off the historic earnings per share number, but stock markets are forward looking things. They will try and look at forecast earnings per share, divide the price by the forecast earnings per share, and that gives you your PE. Let's just say roughly the UK stock market for choice. You can do it for a whole market if you want, but let's just say roughly company Z is on a forward PE of 10. What does that actually mean? Well, think about it. If you're dividing the share price by the earnings per share, you can do this another way. Market cap divided by net profit. It's exactly the same calculation. So what the PE is telling you is how many years it will take the company to earn its market cap in net profit if profits stay flat. Now, 10 years is quite a long time, but it's not that long. But if you're, say, paying 40 or 50 or 60 times earnings for something, you'd better make sure that that growth comes through. And that is clearly the assumption. The growth will come. So that's why you get companies like Netflix on really high PEs, because the assumption is the net profit will come through. And it's why you get companies like Reach, a newspaper publisher, on a really low PE, because the market's assuming there is no growth and the business is going to shrink forever. Now, it might be right on both counts markets are shrewd things but they're not right all the time and they may end up overpaying for something and underpaying for something else which is potentially your profit opportunity but a PE will tell you how many years it will take the company to earn its current market cap if profits stay flat and the bigger the number the more certain you've got to be the company's going to be around that long its profits going to grow quick enough to justify that valuation because if it isn't you're going to lose your shirt equally it could be understating the growth potential, as you could argue has been the case with many tech stocks for a long time to come. So that's not advice on tech stocks, but it explains why they trade on very, very high PEs, because people are practicing factoring in huge future growth. Uh, one final question, and then we'll have to give it a, a, a wrap. But if you've got any more, email them into the marketing team or customer services, and we'll do our best to help, because that will, if nothing else, germinate ideas for future webinars. Our company accounts a good source of information on how highly leveraged a company is. As I've just said here, yes, up to a point with that net gearing calculation looked at in the context then of interest cover and free cash flow cover and how much profit and cash flow is around to pay the interest bill that results from that net debt. But again, companies will try and present the balance sheet in the best possible light to keep not just you happy as a shareholder, but also their bank manager happy and the bond market happy because if the bond market investors think the covenants are about to be broken they might start selling the debt and it'd be harder for the company to borrow in the future or it'll be more expensive or worse comes the worse the bank will pull the plug so they will definitely and as you can see at the moment 
lots of companies that are being given a lot of slack by their banks, by their bondholders. Multiple examples in the everyday Cine world very recently of the bank waiving a covenant test, which is normally a multiple, normally that the, the debt position can only be a certain multiple of the profit in a, in a given year. They're waiving those to give companies time to come through the current circumstances that we're all doing our best to come through. Uh, and so th there has been a lot of understanding there. I think under normal circumstances, uh, things would have been a lot more difficult. The banks have been very understanding. Uh, bondholders have been as flexible as they can be, and they're trying to help companies through the current situation. So the accounts are a good source of leverage, which is how much debt there is on the balance sheet. But again, not perfect because they can be dressed up. And again, you then need to look at them in the context of the company's ability to pay. Companies don't go bust because they've got no cash. They go bust because they just haven't got enough. So thank you very much for your time, everybody. I really, really appreciate it. Um, we will send you the slides. We will send you a link to, the, to a recording. And we appreciate any feedback. We appreciate your support and custom. And I hope that you and your families are all keeping well in these difficult and unusual times. And I look forward to staying in touch.